Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. It's always a good day uh, when we can uh, check in again uh, with, uh, I think, one of the most important thinkers uh, for the church uh, of our lifetime. That's Oz Guinness. Uh, He's spoken with us at the Wilberforce Weekend, during our Truth Love Together event, taught for various short courses, taught for our Colson Fellows, uh, highly published author, a social critic. Uh, his bio, I'm just looking at it here, Oz, your, your bio is, uh, it's, it's, it's almost too long to read, but the key point of it today, and our audience knows you well, uh, is just a congratulations are in order for uh, the, a book, one of your first books. Was it your first book, The Dust of Death? The first book, yes. The first book uh, has been republished. Uh, by InterVarsity Press and chosen as uh, one of their Christian classic series. You know, that, that's, that's quite an accomplishment for your, I, I, I just put that together. I mean, it's great to be in a lineup with C.S. Lewis and, you know, Tolkien and, 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 and so many others. Uh, this was your first book. And I was in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was at Labrie, they gave me six weeks to write it. That's all. So, so so it's let me give everyone like. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me give everyone the title, The Dust of Death, The 60s Counterculture and How It Changed America Forever. Uh, the book is uh, basically trying to trace out the legacy of the 1960s. Obviously a, just an incredibly vital uh, decade in American history, but really even beyond that. Um, and uh, and it's interesting too that this book having, you know, really kind of locking in on the 60s uh, and the legacy that it left on America to be chosen to be part of the series, I, I guess at some level has to be vindication that your your analysis was pretty close. I think so. Well, I, first when they suggested it, I thought, my goodness, no one's going to read it. This is ancient history. <laughs> and the current generation doesn't even read history, let alone recent history. But the 60s is the key to understanding where we are today. And that's why I was hopeful. And I hope people, particularly I've written a new introduction showing how the 60s has to be understood if you do know what's going on today. And that's the significance of it. Let me start here with the story behind it. Because, you know, again, you're at Labrie at this point. You come to America for a visit and it inspires this book. Tell a little bit about what you saw. You know, you know, I, you know obviously... Uh, Books often come out of us when we can't not say what we feel like we have to say. And mm -hmm. um, something happened on that trip for you here that, that made you want to write this. Well, I grew up in China, as many of you know. But I, I was at school in England, never been to the U.S. And 68 was an extraordinary year with the assassination of Martin Luther King, Senator Kennedy. 100 American cities were ablaze. So I said to Francis Schaeffer, could I? come with him. I'd never been. And at first he said, no, he was very private and he didn't want anyone with him. And then he said, you can come if you carry my bags and so on. <laughs> so I was here six weeks with him. We went from Harvard to Berkeley and Stanford and from Christian colleges like Calvin and Gordon to Covenant and Westmont. I met Mario Stavio, who'd uh, led the free speech movement at Berkeley in 1964. It was an extraordinary time. But I realized I needed to understand this. Hmm. And the books on it at the time, the big sellers, Theodore Rojak, The Making of the Counterculture, Charles Reich, The Greening of America, they didn't get it right. And so I went back and prepared a series of separate talks of the Brie on different aspects of the 60s. And people kept coming up and saying, why don't you write it? And write it? I never thought of being a writer. Eventually, my old teacher from high school came out. Hmm. He said, you should really write this. I, I thought, well, I'll have a go. And it sold well. And it got me into cultural commentary and writing. But the key thing is the understanding. So let's talk about the understanding. And we can start at a, a lot of different places. And I, and I, I definitely want to get to... Um, uh, where you think your analysis needs to be tweaked or, you know, the, you, but start with what was the core of your analysis of the 60s in the dust of death? And um, 
and, and how do you think that these other folks that were writing about this really from a more positive, you know, we need this sort of social revolution. This is going to bring about a utopian, you know, it's going to, you know, at least contribute to our utopian future. Got it wrong. What was unique about the analysis here? Was the Christian realism. Hmm. No, as you put your finger on it, so much of it was secularist, humanist, and therefore on many points, utopian. They thought it would work peace breaking out and so on and they were very wrong very so wrong it, 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 the tragedy was when i came i only met in six weeks one evangelical leader who really understood what was happening christians i met were shocked you know horrified all that they saw but understanding no and the one was carl henry hmm. And I realized a lot of Christians simply didn't understand this profoundly significant decade. So you take the deep divisions today. Well, they go back to ideas that came up in the 60s, because what we call now neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism, growing from Antonio Gramsci in the 20s, picked up by the Frankfurt School through the 40s to the 60s. Well, in the 60s, Herbert Marcuse, in California. He was virtually the godfather of the new left. But for all the radicalisms, and as I said, a hundred American cities were ablaze, but they realized they wouldn't win that way. Hmm. And so he and a German radical, Rudi Deutsche, called for a long march through the institutions. In other words, like Mao Zedong, don't try and win in the streets, win the cultural gatekeepers colleges, universities, high schools, press, media, and the world of Hollywood and entertainment. Win those worlds and then sweep down and win the culture. And they've effectively done it, as we can see in the cancel culture, the speech codes, and so much of the politically correct nonsense that's so dangerous. Yeah, that reminds me, I think Todd Gitlin, uh, you know, who, a liberal writer who wrote a history of the 60s, put it somewhat similarly when he said, you know, after the 60s, the right marched on the White House and the left marched on the English departments. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you fast forward a decade or two and they both got what they, 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 they aimed for, uh, but you keep going and you see kind of who, who, who wins in, in the end. No, Todd Gitlin wrote a long time after. <laughs> you know, right, it was, wrote, he, not during the 60s, but looking no, back at it, sure. I wrote in 71. <laughs> and a lot of people thought I was mad. I mean, it really did look. Billy Graham visited Labrie about that time, and he shared with us Richard Nixon, President Nixon, and said to him, I may well be the last elected American president. That's wow. the sense of crisis that there was at the time. So Todd's looking back, easy to look back 10 years later. But I remember people saying, what on earth are you arguing? It looks as if they're going to win. But just so, Christian realism showed they wouldn't. Right. So, so what held it off? I mean, you, you look at a prediction like Nixon's. Uh, I mean, maybe he was just, you know, too negative. Uh, but, but now it seems we can look at kind of the current state of things and think, well, you can see that from here, that sort of future that Nixon predicted. Why was he wrong then? Um, what held off the, kind of that absolute chaos? Well, think for a start, number one, that radical left has won in large parts of America, including, sadly, some of the business world, the sort of woke business. But put another big factor into the picture. If you look at establishment liberalism, it used to be liberals were very different from the left. But what you've seen in the same amount of time is a hollowing out of liberalism. Hmm. After all, there's no basis for freedom, many other problems and a harmonizing between liberalism and the left. So the more you see now, the old-fashioned liberals are much closer in the modern form to the left than they used to be to the past. So there's almost a coup now. You've got political liberalism, the universities, the entertainment world, the high-tech media world. Go on down the line. Of course, high school education, Howard Zinn's view of American history. There's hardly a serious part of the ideas that understands the American Revolution today. And that's, just, I call it the coup. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, one option, the revolution. 
And with the face of revolution recently being Antifa and Black Lives Matter, people are gone, oh no, that's too much. But they don't realize how much there's been a coup of the left taking over traditional liberalism with this consolidation of powers. If they change the Supreme Court and bring in extra senators through Puerto Rico or whatever, you could have one party national government that's the end of the American freedom. You've already got one party faculties, many Ivy League schools, one party newsrooms in many newspapers, one party boardrooms, and one party states like California. If America goes a one party country, that would be the end of the American Republic. So you've mentioned in your visit in the United States, not meeting very many evangelical leaders who really understood the significance of the decade, the significance of the transfer. One, Carl Henry, uh, which what a great connection. I've kind of uh, with uh, w- with the Colson Center. He was one of Chuck yeah. Colson's first theological uh, advisors. Was on the board and so on. Uh, what's your what's your um, what's your grade that you would give evangelical leadership today? Um, are, are we more awake? Or are we just more panicked in terms of? Uh, kind of what's at stake and uh, how vulnerable things are. I know, I know, for example, you still strongly embrace and claim that title of being an evangelical uh, mm-hmm. and in a culture where evangelical itself has lost its meaning in so many different ways. Um, but, but, but talk more about that. How, would you give us a better grade now than back then? I'm an unashamed evangelical because I define it theologically by the teaching of Jesus and the Bible. So I will be unashamed evangelical till I die. (laughs) I'm not ashamed of that at all. In other words, I refuse to define it culturally and above all politically. Mm -hmm. I think there are many more evangelicals who really understand well, but as a movement as a whole, we're more divided, more shallow, more disillusioned by various failed enterprises, you know, like the prosperity doctrines, like the megachurch movement, like the seeker-sensitive movement. They were all attempts to be relevant, which failed one way after another. And so evangelicalism today is shallow and very confused. We need an awakening to going back to be what it means to be evangelical. But we're in a bad shape at the moment. But of course, there are many, many more who understand today. I mean, wonderful, say, take historians. Bill McClay's new book, The Land of Hope, and the wonderful historians like Mark Knoll, George Marsden, Nathan Hatch, and so on. And that's just one area. You can think of so many people who really understand now in great, great depth. So the people who truly understand, we're far better off than we were then. But sadly, the movement as a whole, you know, we tasted the power of relevance and chased it. You think of all the follies in the last 50 years, and we're paying for them. I think we are paying for them. I mean, I I, I think, for example, a market-driven approach to church and to church growth and attendance, it, it, it gets exposed at a time like COVID, right? Where if you're used to basically going and watching a show and hey, the home theaters are getting better than they used to be. Why, why, why go to church at all? It, it seems this could be a really a breaking point for that kind of way of seeing church and seeing evangelicalism. And that's that sort of thing at the coal face, as it were. But hmm. you know, if you go back to the original ideas, I won't mention names, but someone you and I know extremely well. You know, he said in the seeker sensitive movement, the audience, not the message, is sovereign. Well, that's disastrous. Paul is all things to all people, but the audience was never sovereign. The gospel is sovereign, and he's shaping it and textualizing it and so on, just as our Lord became a human to reach us poor humans. So we contextualize the gospel in a thousand ways, but we never sell it out. And the idea that the audience becomes Sovereign is a disastrous notion, and many followed that for a whole generation. 
Yeah, that's right. And it, and it has multiple different forms. And it seems even the retreat to some traditional liturgy or something like that is often couched in terms of what we'll sell yeah. to, to young people today. Right. My guest today is Oz Guinness, uh, his book, The Dust of Death. His, his first book, which if you know anything about Oz Guinness, that was a long time ago. That, <laughs> there was a lot of books in between then and now. I, I, I was thinking about this, Oz, at our interview, and I was reminded of Chuck Colson talking about meeting someone on an airplane who talked about, you know, how historical he, you know, the historical nature of Nixon and all that. And Chuck was, you know, talking about it. And the person said, oh, yeah, and you're in my kid's history book. And he thought, oh, no, that says a lot about who you are when you're in your kid's history book. But Oh, I, I remember Chuck coming to, to faith. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean that would have been in that same written. ballpark of when you wrote Dust of Death, right? Well, it was a little after. He mm -hmm. came to faith, what, 73? 73, yep. I, I wrote this in 71. Wow. But I remember him coming to Oxford, and at that stage, he was still smoking like a chimney, and we had to take him out. We had to take him out from the meetings behind the church so he could have a quick cigarette and then go back in for the Q&A. Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to air this or not. I'm going to oh, have no, to check with my board. No, no. <laughs> and then, of course, he, he grew in the depth of yeah. his commitment and his understanding in every way, and he became a, a hero and a giant of the faith. Well, yeah, and dealing with so many of the ideas, uh, really kind of getting, and it really was thanks to people like uh, Carl Henry, who you mentioned, and others who, mm -hmm. you know, really took him under his, their wing and, and mentored him in theological and, and even, you know, larger worldview uh, categories. Um, uh, so let, let's talk about uh, where you think you would, how, how would you change the dust of death Today, what do you think you got? Anything you think you got just dreadfully wrong, or uh, at least you know history predicting the future is obviously uh, you know a dangerous business. But uh, anything you you think you misread uh, back then? Not really. The big changes are actually <laughs> small changes. I mean, in the sixties, you could say man. You can't say that now. You have to say men and women. Right. And they're all that. The whole language game is different. But the big intellectual thing for me, when I wrote that, I'd only been at college. I hadn't even been to graduate school. And so looking back now, I was writing from the perspective of the history of ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at everything in terms of ideas, philosophical trends, and so on. Whereas I went to do my doctorate under Peter Berger, I'm now aware you have the history of ideas, and then you have what's called cultural analysis, so he called it technically the sociology of knowledge. We needn't mm -hmm. bother with the terms. But you're looking at a much broader perspective. But in terms of the analysis, I think it pretty well stands up. So let's talk about, you know, we look out our window right now. Uh, the things that are dominating the headlines, um, obviously deep political divide, uh, a way of understanding racial tension um, that uh, is known as critical theory, critical race theory, but based on kind of a, a deeper uh, philosophical framework called critical theory. Uh, we, you've already used the term kind of woke business. Um, you know, that's a, certainly a whole school of thought. D do you see a direct line from the things, you know, that we were talking about in the, uh, you know, 80s and 90s that you predicted in the early 70s and dust of death? When we talk about things like, uh, postmodernism um, and uh, secularism. What, what, what's the line from, from those ideas um, to uh, th these things that we see on, you know, that's dominating our culture right now? You know, I've argued that the deepest divide in America is between those who understand America from the perspective of the American Revolution, largely biblical through the Reformation, and those who understand it from the perspective of the heirs of the French Revolution. So not secularism, that's earlier, mm -hmm. but political correctness, postmodernism, tribal politics, identity politics, the woke movement, the sexual revolution, every one of those comes from ideas that came down from Paris. Now, I don't mean Paris today. The revolution <laughs> in France only lasted 10 years, and then came Napoleon. But like a volcanic explosion, the lava has flowed out. And the most obvious lava is what's called revolutionary socialism. In other words, communism. Karl Marx, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. I was there. 
But what America is facing is this revolutionary liberationism. This is the neo-Marxism, Gramsci, Frankfurt School, etc. Now that's what brings together woke business and political correctness, the cancel culture and all that stuff. Christians have got to understand it because you take a lot of the young evangelicals or many pastors because the left says justice, take say the awful killing of George Floyd, they leap and salute, not realizing the left and the Bible and the gospel speak against injustice. But the way they both address it is entirely different. And I've met pastors and talked to them who really have drunk the Kool-Aid. And the tragedy is that evangelicals resisted liberalism, theological liberalism, revisionism. 200 years we've resisted that. That's never made an impact on the evangelicals in depth. We have capitulated to the sexual revolution and now to left-wing critical theory and race relations in an incredible degree. That too many young evangelicals have drunk the Kool-Aid, they're not doing the analysis which would open their eyes. Now, I think if you're interested, John, post-election, we face a simple choice between three. I put it like this. You have to unpack them all in depth. Revolution, hmm. what we're describing. Coup, what I mentioned earlier, the way liberalism in its traditional form is hollowing out and consolidating across the elite institutions. The third option, homecoming. Hmm. Everybody knows that the Greek word for repentance is metanoia, an about turn of heart and mind. Many people don't know that the Hebrew word has another dimension. It's an about turn of heart and mind, yes, but it also means homecoming. And that's a very American term. In other words, sin is exile and alienation. Repentance leads you to homecoming. Now, I say that because you think both candidates talked, one about make America great, but bless his heart, he never said what made it great in the first place. And the other candidate talked about restore the soul of America, but he never said what was the soul of America. In other words, followers of Jesus have got to be the leaders in a true homecoming. As you probably know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and many say, Rousseau says, you know, when nations are young, they're teachable. Mm. When they're old, they're incorrigible, his word. In other words, you can't go back. Now, we believe in revival, renewal, restoration, above all in the resurrection. So, yes, we believe a return is possible. So evangelicals have got to know what is it about the first principles of freedom and truth and justice and words and human dignity that we need to recover so that we lead a genuine homecoming. So that, so it, there's the choices. Revolution? Please God, no. Please God, coup? no. Mm -hmm. Coup? Please God, no. But well, that's the one that looks likely at the moment. Homecoming? Please Lord. Well, I mean, you know, the homecoming obviously is connected to a revival and that's something, you know, um, you can't schedule, right? You, you pray for it. You beg God for it. Um, sometimes it comes after collapse um, and uh, or after one of these other things, a revolution or a coup kind of full, fails to fulfill its promises. But the coup to me seems to be the most likely because of that long march through the institutions. And once, as you mentioned earlier, once the woke business community started leveraging power that's almost irresistible it, it, it's almost uh impossible to fight that uh and then you add the you know technological surveillance state and all kinds of things and mm -hmm. you know I, I feel like i'm talking like a conspiracy theorist at this point but no, no. it seems pretty uh it seems pretty self-evident no you're absolutely right but while a sovereign awakening an outpouring of the spirit of god my great grandfather was in the irish revival 1859 mm -hmm. so i know what you mean 1739 1859 whatever it is that's what we ultimately need but remember, unlike the early church, where they were a tiny minority, had mm -hmm. zero political power, we are a republic. In other words, 
every American is responsible for the American Republic. So it's incumbent on every citizen to be engaged and involved, regardless of what the odds are. How, how, so, do, you, how do you tell a, a, an everyday Christian? Because uh, right now, I think we have a church that is weary of the, any sort of political engagement to the point that we're taking very clear moral issues and putting them in the, the bucket of politics saying, I don't want to touch that. Um, and as you said, uh, it, it's really affecting churches. I mean, we are hearing all the time from churches that are just being split because of either, you know, critical theory or because of wokeness or because of the, the election or something like that. How do we move the church back into some sort of political engagement that takes these things seriously without becoming a pawn of one party or the other? Well, first identify the extremes. Privatization, where faith is privately engaging, publicly relevant, clearly wrong. Jesus (laughs) is Lord of all. But then the church, when it woke up to that first era, swung to the other extreme of politicization. Politics is the be all and end all of everything. And you know well, John, Politics is downstream. Mm -hmm. The deepest things in America are actually socially in families, intellectually in notions such as truth and freedom. That's where our strong suit is. So I'm not saying we should do this for political reasons. We should do this for the gospel reasons, Mm -hmm. for humanity's reasons. In other words, I was on a call earlier today and someone was saying, do we need to get back to Jerusalem rather than Athens? And I said, actually, the real call is back to Sinai because <laughs> human dignity, freedom, mm-hmm. words, truth, the critique of the abuse of power, thats they're all there in Sinai. Our Lord just develops it through Isaiah and through his own ministry. They're all there in Sinai. We need Sinai-shaped America hmm. because of the revolution. The notion of constitution comes from the Jewish notion of government. We are the heirs of the greatest truths humanity needs to be human and free. In other words, the big question is, is it still possible to form societies that do justice to human dignity and freedom and so on? And we would say, yes, and this is the way. And we have in the Old Testament and the New an incredible blueprint and precedent. So we've got to move off the back foot. Well, we're going to have to make it not in political terms, right? But in gospel terms. Well, I think that's going to be the task for folks like us is is to be able to make that case that this is this is a uh, an obedience issue uh, to the to the scope of the gospel and to the authority of Christ and and to steward what is good. And I, it's going to be a tough one. I, I I'm no. hearing a lot more of that same sort of. A false, uh, you know, we need to get back to Jerusalem instead of Athens sort of, sort of thinking from a lot of religious leaders. And, and it, it, it's wrong. It's not the way we need to go. But I think if, if people see the quandaries of humanity without God, hmm. and then they see the profundity of the truths of both Testaments, the old and the new, but starting with the old, people get excited. This is an incredible moment of opportunity. So it's time for people to get off the back foot and to see that we truly have the key to an advanced movement in America and in the wider world. This is an amazing moment. My next book is much more positive. It's called The Magna Carta of Humanity on recovering the biblical roots of many of these great themes. Yeah. Well, listen, that that can't come soon enough. We're always grateful Oz, whenever you can stop in and join us here at the Colson Center for uh, many things uh, which you've participated in. And congratulations again, my guest today, Oz Guinness, his book, his first book. How many books have you written now, Oz? I don't count them. You don't count them. Over 30. Well, that says a lot when you've lost count how many you've written. You know, even if you don't try, you you know. You know, but for I'm a most people, skeptic about numbers, <laughs> polling and numbers and statistics. Forget it. Forget it. Well, the book is "The Dust of Death: The Sixties Counterculture and How It Changed America Forever." First published in 1971, and no, I wrote, wrote it in 71, 73, and, and and now it's been republished as part of the InterVarsity Press Signature 
collection, uh, which is a remarkable achievement. And uh, it's one of those books that the analysis has stood the test of time. Uh, Oz, we're grateful for you. Uh, thanks for uh, also ending our conversation today on a, on, on a call, on a, on a, on a, I want to say a sign of hope, but really a kind of a nudge. Uh, this is a great opportunity despite the crisis around us. Not a nudge, John, a push. A push. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, Jenny and I were great admirers of Chuck mm. and equally of all that you're doing. So it's always a privilege. But this is a time to be exuberant and exhilarated about all that the gospel gives us looking at the challenges of the 21st century. This is no moment for fear or discouragement. We'll end it at that. Thanks so much, Oz. Great to see you, my friend, and always Thank good you. to have you on the Breakpoint Podcast.